What a truth. Let's pray about that truth and pray for our time together tonight. Father in heaven, there is no greater thought, there is no greater message, there is no greater peace than knowing that you have the power to save. And that we will do that one day with bodies that don't resemble this body, bodies that are of another nature, bodies not marred and stained by sin, bodies that are able to praise you in a manner that you are worthy of. Lord, the events that precede that will be the coming of your Son. What a joy, what a blessing to all of those who have placed their trust and their confidence in you. I pray, Father, that you would grant your grace to us tonight as we examine this dear letter, Lord, that is, has so much to do with the coming of your Son. Lord, would you grant us your grace to engage with your word? Would you grant us your spirit to give us discerning eyes with what we read and what we hear? Lord, I pray that you would be the speaker tonight. You would be honored in that, and I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Welcome to our next installment of the 66 books. We are on the book of 2 Thessalonians. It is my privilege to bring that to you. If you would, turn in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians. And as you do that, I want you to imagine that you're undertaking something very new. Maybe you've moved to a new town. Maybe you're embarking on a new career. Maybe you're learning a new language. And you need something to get started. You need something to help you, something that will guide you as you get started. And someone comes and they, they share that with you. And you think, great, I have what I need, I'm ready to go. They share that with you and they leave. They're no longer co-located with you, they're somewhere else. They gave you words of truth, they gave you words that helped you, they gave you words of great understanding. And you think, I'm good, I'm well. But then another message comes along and there are two things about that message. One is that that message is contrary to the first message you heard. And the second, message, the second issue is that message is local to you. And it's in front of you all the time, and you're hearing it all the time. That's unbalancing. That's unsettling. That's disturbing. That's alarming. And that's exactly what we have in 2 Thessalonians. Let's get our bearings again on what has taken place prior to the writing of 2 Thess. Uh, Paul went on his first missionary journey sometime in the mid-40s AD, and then he embarked on his second missionary journey about 49 AD. He was on that journey for about three or four years. It was during that time that he started that journey in uh, present-day Turkey, what is Asia Minor in our scriptures. He traveled northwest into Macedonia, and then southwest down through Achaia. And he finds himself in Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17. So let's go there first. You see in Acts chapter 17 the story of Paul's ministry in Thessalonica. And you can see that verses 2 through 4 are the only verses that actually describe his ministry. He comes in, he meets in the synagogue, he, he explains that Christ is indeed the Messiah. But notice how much space and how much ink is dedicated in verses 5 through 9 to persecution. You have more words spoken about the persecution that the church endured in Thessalonica because of Paul's ministry than you have about the ministry itself. So in verse 10, you see that Paul leaves and he goes to Berea. He traveled from Berea, and then he goes to Athens, and then he ends up in Corinth, and he stays there for 18 months. We see that in Acts chapter 18, verse 11. He stayed there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among the people in Corinth. So he's there, and it's during that time that he wrote both of his letters to the church in Thessalonica. If you turn back just a couple of pages from our First Thess reference, you can go to First Thess chapter 3, and you can see the nature of Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. How am I doing? Am I okay? All right. First Thess, Thess chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Paul is now in Corinth, and he knows that there are distressing, troubling situations in Thessalonica. So, when we could endure it no longer, we, which is Paul and Silas and Timothy, were pleased to be left behind at Athens alone. We sent Timothy, our brother, God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, 
to strengthen and encourage you. That's a hint there that the, per the persecution in Thessalonica is ongoing. You drop down to verse 6 and you see that Timothy brought a good report back. He has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love. And so Paul and Silas are encouraged by the report that they get. That was in the earlier part of A.D. 51. It was probably later, several months later, that Paul writes his second letter, either at the end of 51 or the beginning of 52. And it's very helpful for us to understand the context of the New Testament canon, the state of the New Testament canon at this time. Sometime around A.D. 51, what does the, the New Testament look like at this point? Well, you have James, and you have Galatians that were written in the mid and the late 40s. And you have Mark's Gospel and Matthew's Gospel that were probably written sometime in the mid-50s, so they probably weren't there yet. So what you have is no Gospels, likely. You have no Romans, so you don't have a complete treatment of the Gospel. You have no Ephesians, so you have no message of salvation by grace through faith. You don't have the pastoral epistles, so you don't know how the church is supposed to function, but you're a church. You don't have Hebrews, so you don't know about the supremacy of Christ in 13 chapters of details that you see there. And you don't have Revelation. What you do have is Paul's first letter, and you have the Old Testament scriptures. We have three things in view here that Paul is writing to them to discuss. Uh, first, Paul is writing to address the issue of persecution and how they need to think about that persecution. We see most of that in chapter 1. Then you see in chapter 2 how Paul addresses the issue of false teaching that's present in the church and around the church, being brought to the church in Thessalonica. And that goes through the first part of chapter 3. And then he ends the letter by addressing issues of personal conduct. So let's look together at the first 12 verses and see what Paul has to say about how to bring comfort to this church in the midst of persecution. And that comfort comes in two pieces. It comes with a commendation, and it also comes with judgment. So let's read verses 1 through 4 together of chapter 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is only fitting, because your faith is growing abundantly. And the love of each one of you all toward one another increases all the more, so that we ourselves boast about you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all of your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. Notice Paul's gratitude is what he starts with here. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, and notice why that is. There are two things that are growing. Their faith is growing abundantly. And the love that each one has towards one another is growing as well. So they've got a church whose faith is growing and their love for one another is increasing. And this is a sign of a healthy church. It's a very, very young church. But it's a healthy church for those reasons. And again, we just need to remember that they don't have a whole lot to work with here. At this time of the writing of Second Thess, they've got First Thess and they've got some other books however available those were, and they've got their Old Testament scriptures. But look at verse 4 and, and see the fruit of their faith. Paul actually boasts about them among the churches of God. Why does he boast about them? He boasts about them because of two things. One is their perseverance, and the other is their faith in the midst of all of their afflictions. So the fruit of their faith is perseverance, and not just perseverance in regular stuff, but perseverance in the midst of all of their persecutions and afflictions which they endure. And this is persecution specifically because of the gospel message and their faithfulness to Christ, and we'll get there in a bit. But this persecution was very likely because of the same people that drove Paul out of there in the first place. Now, back in Acts chapter 17, verse 5, we read that the Jews were becoming jealous, and they took along some wicked men from the marketplace, and they formed a mob, and they set the city in an uproar, and attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the assembly. Notice what is taking place in what I just read from Acts chapter 17. What's motivating them? The Jews were being motivated by jealousy. Verse 5 says, becoming jealous. So that tells us that this was not some racial or ethnic hatred that had been placed for centuries. It wasn't something that was long-standing and pre-existing. This jealousy was becoming jealous. It's something that came about. It was a recent hostility 
And it was concurrent with Paul's arrival in his gospel message. And this was not Paul's objective. His objective was not to breed hostility among others towards him or towards the church, but in establishing a church that is young, but that is loving and joyful and faithful. They remain faithful, they're joyful, they're loving towards one another, they're persevering members. This aligned them behind Paul, and that is what made the Jews jealous. They saw that Paul had a following. What the Jews craved more than anything else was a following. So again, Paul is commending them for their faith and their perseverance. And and it's good for us to stop and ask ourselves a question. Are we known for our faith the way that these people are? When people think about us, is the most significant thing about us our trust in the gospel? It's important for us to think about. So Paul brings comfort to them by commending them. But he also brings comfort to them Can I go with the mic? All right, let's try this. Paul also brings comfort to them through a judgment, and we see that uh, in verses 5 through 12. And normally judgment and comfort don't really go together, but we're going to see as we read this passage that they in fact do. Let's read verses 5 through 12 together. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which indeed you are suffering, since it is right for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give rest to you who are afflicted, and to us as well at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven, with his mighty angels in flaming fire, executing vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed, for our witness to you was believed. To this end, we also pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill all your good pleasure for goodness in the work of faith with power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So here again, Paul's comfort is going to come in the context of the judgment. But first, he's speaking within the context of judgment about those who persevere. And we see that in verse 5. So that you, Thessalonians, will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which indeed you are suffering. We just think back to the previous verse, verse 4. They are persevering in faith in the midst of their suffering. And this is what is key here. That is that their perseverance is what demonstrates that they are worthy of the kingdom of God. They patiently endured unjust suffering, and they they endured that, and their suffering was because of their faith in Christ. And that patient perseverance and endurance is the proof that God is working to make his people worthy of his kingdom. Now, when we suffer, we can be tempted to believe that God has abandoned us. God is not near. That's the obvious conclusion, right? Because I'm suffering. This is hard. How can God be near if I'm suffering? Well, that is a broken perspective. Turn back just a a page or two to 1 Thess chapter 3. Paul helps us understand that we need to keep this in view because we've been saved by grace and saved into the body of Christ. Paul is speaking of afflictions, and he says, you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. Why are believers destined for suffering and persecution and affliction? Because that's part of the process that God uses to identify those who are his. The Christian, their perseverance in suffering is proof that God is actually working to perfect them. To perfect the work that he began in them. So Paul is comforting with this message. You can know your salvation is real. You can know that it's secure because you have proven that you are willing to suffer for Christ. So that's Paul's primary means of comfort. It's a perseverance that proves possession by God. So persecution, or sorry, perseverance is a proof of possession. But notice also in the same passage, there's the idea of a future rest that is coming. And we see that in verses 6 and 7. Starting in verse 6 and remembering that Paul is speaking again to the church in Thessalonica who's suffering. He says, it is right for God, and then in verse 7, to give rest to you who are afflicted. And to us as well at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven. And we can take away two things about that rest for us here in verse 7. 
First of all, notice, to you who are afflicted and to us as well. This tells us that rest with Christ does not depend on the suffering itself. Rather, it depends on something that is far less circumstantial, something that's true for all believers. And that is that their reconciliation to God through faith in Christ. That's what gives them a future rest. So what this does is that instructs them to maintain a strong foundation of their faith, regardless of their circumstances. They can be assured of their position in Christ because of their faith in Christ, regardless of whether they're experiencing suffering or not. The second thing we notice about this rest is that when it's going to come, it's going to come at the revelation of the Lord Jesus. So this comfort is not an immediate relief, rather it's coming sometime in the future. And this is instructive to them as well. And what it instructs them to do is to find their security, not in some safety net here in this world, but rather to excel still more at what they're patiently doing already, patiently waiting for the return of Christ. And we know they're patiently waiting for the return of Christ. You think back to chapter one of the first letter at the end of the chapter. What happens there is Paul says to them, remember how you turn from idols to serve a living and true God. And in verse 10, he says, not only did you do that, but you, you turned to wait for his son from heaven. And so this is really good shepherding on Paul's part. What he's doing is he's pointing to something that they've already been doing. And he's saying, excel still more in that same thing. So there's comfort throughout all of God's judgment, but notice the fact that God is also an avenging God. And we see that in this same passage. God's character compels him not only to sanctify his own through perseverance, but to avenge himself on those who are persecuting his loved ones, those who are his enemies. We see that in verse six, it's right for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. We ask ourselves, well, how is that comforting? We see that God's judgment on the unbeliever is not some arbitrary, vague outpouring of wrath. It's actually a very informed vengeance. And this repayment is commensurate with the original affliction. See there where it says, in order to repay affliction with affliction. In order for that to be case, it must be true that God sees and knows the affliction. He can't repay affliction with affliction unless he's familiar with the affliction. So that tells the people in Thessalonica that God sees and knows their suffering. And that's encouraging. You have a circumstance that God himself is very informed about. Notice in verse 8 who it is that God takes his vengeance on. He executes vengeance on those who do not know God and that those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. What Paul is doing here, again, is he's drawing the attention away from the immediate, the persecution, and he's putting it where it belongs, in the arena of knowing and obeying God. This is where your attention needs to stay. It already is, but make sure you keep it there. God will execute his vengeance not only on those who persecute Christians, but on all who refuse to know him and obey him. And then we see the permanence of that destruction in verse 9 away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. And Paul tells them something about the circumstances of this in verse 10 that is also encouraging. This takes place when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed. We know this, the reference here is to the second coming of Christ, when Christ will come and establish his rule and his reign on this earth, ruling over the entire earth from Jerusalem. But there's comfort here that Paul provides, and that is that Christ will be glorified in his saints on that day. And the message there for the Thessalonians is this, the saint who is faithful today will be the cause of Christ's glory in his return. That's encouraging as well. That helps them understand that there is a point to this. They will be saved by their persevering faith through this affliction, and they will be part of the cause of Christ's glory in the future. So you notice how strongly Paul's comfort is tied to Christ's return. Christ's return is a big part of this letter. So we have to ask ourselves as a point of application, when we find ourselves in trial, how do we mitigate our situation? Do we mitigate our situation by our own creativity or our own finances or just plain hard work and say to ourselves, you know what, I'm going to get myself out of this? Or do we recognize that in persevering through the trial, 
It's that that shows us that we belong to Christ and we will be with him forever. So a clear understanding of Christ's return is essential for the Christian. It's essential for us to persevere well today. We need to understand exactly what's taking place in the future because that guides our perseverance today. And that's why Paul goes where he does next. So let's look at chapter two. We're going to look at the lie that's in place, and then we're going to look at the correction of that lie. And the lie takes place in the first couple of verses of chapter two. But before we go there, put yourself in the mind of those who are persecuting the Jews, those who are providing the false teaching to the Jews, uh, the Christians. You know that they had questions for Paul. The main question that prompted one of the writings of the first letter was, what is going to happen to all of those who die before Christ returns? Paul addresses that at the end of chapter four of his first letter. And then he speaks about the day of Christ or the day of the Lord in, in the beginning of chapter five. And we know what he says in, in chapter four at the end of that chapter in the first letter. He says, Christ will descend and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then those who are alive will be snatched away and will be together with Christ forever. We'll be with him in the clouds. And he ends that by saying, comfort one another with this. Use these words to comfort one another. So this is true. So the persecutors know that the, the Thessalonians have this information. They know that, that Christ will return. They know that they know this. But if you want to destroy someone's confidence and someone's comfort that is based in an event that is going to take place, the right way to do that is to try to convince them that that event has already taken place. That's exactly what you see at the beginning of the chapter. Paul writes, now we ask you brothers, again, they're brothers. This is a comforting letter. This is a very pastoral letter. Brothers, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with him. This is what he was telling them about in, in chapter four of his first letter. That you not be quickly shaken in your mind or be alarmed, whether by a spirit or by a word or a letter, as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So this is exactly what's happening. And there are three mechanisms here that are being used by the persecutors, by the false teachers, to sow these seeds of doubt. There is, you see them there, there is a spirit or a word or a letter as if from us. The spirit is likely not an evil spirit, but rather it's something that may have been motivated by an evil spirit. It might very well be uh, somebody who's manifesting the form of an authoritative man, like a false teacher. The spirit might be pointing to the false teacher. The word might be something a little bit less authoritative, but a message that everybody has believed, something that's being circulated in the community that's gaining momentum and a lot of people are listening to it and it's not true. And then you have the third means, and that is a letter, as if from us. Somebody fabricated a letter, somebody produced a letter, and indicated that it was from Paul. And it contained information that was contrary to what Paul had told them in his first letter, especially chapter 4 and chapter 5. And you think about the effect that this would have on a young church. They had legitimate questions of Paul. And Paul took the time to write to them from Corinth, and he gave them answers to their questions. And these were assuring questions reassuring answers to those questions. And now all of that information that brought security, that brought comfort is being contradicted. And you see the effect of that in verse two, that you would not be quickly shaken in your mind or alarmed. I want us to look at the word shaken there for a minute. This is really important that we get this. This word is speaking of a, a massive unsettling that's taking place in their mind. God uses that same word in the New Testament in Hebrews 12, the same Greek word, when he describes what he is going to do to this earth at the end of this age. And he describes that he is going to once more shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. That's Hebrews 12, 26. God will bring massive instability to this earth when he destroys this earth in favor of the new heavens and the new earth. It's that same kind of instability that's inside the mind of the Christians in the church in Thessalonica. And they also have alarm. They're alarmed over this. This isn't just new information. It's something that, that provides instability to them. It's unsettling to them, and they're alarmed over this. And we ask ourselves, well, why would that be such a big deal? Well, the answer is really obvious and straightforward. Paul had taught them that they would be taken from this earth before the terrible day of the Lord. 
Just read the end of chapter four and the beginning of chapter five quickly and carefully. And you can read that one event precedes the other. So their understanding was that we would be taken out of this world before the day of the Lord. And we would be together with Christ. What a blessing that is. But now, if that event has already taken place, their alarm is over the very distinct possibility that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with him, the thing that was going to trigger the gathering together with them had already occurred, that the day of the Lord has already come. And in their mind, the persecution they were experiencing from the Jews was, was actually part of the events that Paul told them that would occur in the tribulation. They were wondering if they missed the return of Christ and the gathering away with them. That's unsettling. That would unsettle me as well. So this is a situation that desperately needs to be corrected. And that's what Paul does in verses 3 through 12. We'll read verses 3 and 4. Paul provides immediate, clear, correcting instructions for them. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it has not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the sanctuary of God, exhibiting himself as being God. So Paul tells him straight up, you have been deceived. This word, this spirit, this letter, they have deceived. They're deceitful. And the truth there is at the beginning of verse 3, it has not come. We ask ourselves, well, what is it? It's the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with him. That's what has not come. And the reason he gives is at the end of verse 3, and that is that the apostasy must come first. Apostasy is the abandoning of any pretense of existing religion, any pretense of it, and establishing self as the object of that worship. And that can be the work of one and only one man, and that is the Antichrist. So Paul is saying the Antichrist has not come. Paul instructs them to remember the truth that they've been taught. And we see that in verse 5. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, he's pointing back to his time when he was with them on his second missionary journey. While I was still with you, I was telling you these things. So he covered all of these things with them, probably on multiple occasions, helping them understand this. So there's a principle for this young church, and it applies to us as well. The principle is that we have to know the truth, and we have to remember the truth, so that we can have a good working knowledge of God's word to guide us in all of our circumstances. So it's their responsibility to know the truth that Paul taught them, and their responsibility to know the truth that he wrote to them. They need to know that. But if you read verse 6, you can see how God's sovereign administration over all things supersedes everything. And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. Paul helps them see how their current persecution fits into God's perfect purpose. God is restraining this man in a way that perfectly fits into his timeline for human history. He says in verse 7, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. The mystery of lawlessness is that man is sinfully rebelling against God. That's worldwide rebellion against God since Genesis chapter 3. That's been taking place forever. This is where Paul correction circles back to comfort here. And we look at that and we see that in verses 8 through 10. When that lawless one has been revealed, whose coming is in accord with the working of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, with all deception and unrighteousness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. He's saying the coming of the Antichrist will be unmistakable. You won't miss it. As deceitful as your persecutors are, what you have today is nothing like the deceit and the deception that will come under the Antichrist. And so they can know that they are not in a time of tribulation, if you look at this passage, because it tells us that the deception is towards those who perish. The deception is in the unbelievers. Paul is encouraging them, saying, you're not in that boat. You're not in that camp. You are not being deceived. You're not perishing. So the first comfort is that the Antichrist has not yet appeared. And the second comfort is that when he does appear, he will be defeated. See that in verse 8. The Lord Jesus will slay the lawless one with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Paul is quoting Isaiah 11 here. And so these are words that were written by Isaiah close to 700 years before 
the Thessalonians received Paul's letter. So this is nothing new. This truth has been around for seven centuries. This is part of God's sovereign plan all along, that Christ himself will defeat the Antichrist and the false prophet, and he will do it with the word of his mouth. The coming of the Antichrist will be unmistakable because of the scope of his worldwide deceit, but it will pale in comparison to the power of Christ. We think about what Revelation tells us in chapter 19 about Armageddon, where the Antichrist and the false prophet had gathered together the largest assembly of military force in human history. And they've gathered it together against the city of Jerusalem, against the Jews who are there. Let me just read verses, uh, verse 20 of Revelation chapter 19. It's going to speak of the beast. That's the Antichrist. The beast was seized and with him the false prophet. So you have the two players there who did the signs in his presence. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. So for all of his pride and arrogance, the Antichrist is denied the chance to even participate in the battle that he's arranging. So there's lots of comfort here to be had in a true, biblical, well-established view of the return of Christ. So what Paul does is he provides the instruction to them saying, you know what, you need to understand that the Antichrist has not yet come. And so all of these things that you're being told have taken place already, namely the return of Christ and the day of the Lord, they simply have not happened because the Antichrist has not yet come. And he spends the rest of his time in chapter 2 and into chapter 3, through verse 5 of chapter 3, informing them as to what their response should be to this. So let's read verses 13 and 14 of chapter 2. There's more comfort and encouragement here before he instructs them how to respond to the lie. He says, We should always give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you as the first fruits for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want us to see right here and notice that all three persons of the Godhead are gathering together in their attention and their care for this church. Notice that they're loved by Christ. Notice also that they're chosen by God and they're being sanctified by his spirit. That's comforting. All three members of the triune Godhead are aware of everything that's taking place within you. You are loved, you are chosen, you're set apart. That should be really, really encouraging. He reiterates the point of the gospel that it's to save by faith. And with that faith comes a perseverance that proves God's choice of you. And so here we see the instruction, the response in verse 15. So then brothers, stand firm, hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. So we see the instruction there. There's two imperatives, stand firm and hold. Hold to those traditions. It's important that they do this. They have a role in this. It's not as if God is going to take care of everything. God does take care of everything. But their task is to stand firm and to hold. Stand firm means don't let anything sway you from you know what is true. Don't be swayed by that. Hold fast and don't cave in on what you know to be true. And that what you know is true is verbal instruction that you've had from me and written instruction that you have had from me. But notice that he also says here, by word of mouth or by letter from us. So it's easy for us to remember the letter. That's what Paul wrote to them, his first letter from Corinth back to them in Thessalonica. But word of mouth is so important in those days. Well, to understand why that's important, we need to remember that it's AD 51. And they don't have the vast majority of their New Testament yet. The New Testament canon had barely opened by this time. So what God did was, through the whole agency of the Holy Spirit, he spoke to the apostles. This is divine revelation to the apostles. And then the apostles, they articulated that revelation to the people in two forms. The written word and in spoken teaching to them. And so it's important for them to remember that they have the truth. Everything that they heard from Paul, as it relates to his teaching of what will come, that was a restatement of what Paul received divinely, apostolic revelation from the Holy Spirit. And notice that Paul tacks on at the end, from us. This is a bit of a shot at the false teachers. 
The circle of men who were appointed by God to receive that divine inspiration, that divine revelation, and then to re-articulate that to the church and to write it down in instruction form to the church was a very small circle of men. It included Paul and the apostles and a few other men, and that was about it. It did not include the false teachers in Thessalonica. So Paul is saying, you have heard the truth from us, and there is no other source of truth. That's encouraging to them. So he says, so don't acknowledge them. Hold fast to what you know is true because those men and what they're saying has no authority. So your comfort can know from, come from knowing that you have the truth. But notice that there is another source of comfort in verses one through five of chapter three. The Lord is faithful in verse three. He will strengthen and guard you from the evil one. So Paul is telling them, persevere, persevere, persevere in all of this. And here's where you see the source of the strength that they will need to persevere is coming from Christ himself. We have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and you will continue to do what we command. The strength of Christ provides them what they need to continue and persevere in the trial. So that's important for them to understand. So in chapter two, in the beginning of chapter three, Paul is helping them to understand rightly the way that the course of human history will play out. That's very, very important to them because it gives them calm. It gives them understanding. It gives them confidence that God's plans will come to pass and that nothing else that is being spoken will indeed come to pass. So persecution and the false teaching were weighing pretty heavily on Paul's mind. But there's a third issue, and it's one that's no less significant. It comes last in the letter, but it's no less significant to them. And it has to do with unruly living. And we see the weight that this has in Paul's mind when we see how it is that he instructs them. Let's look at verse 6 of chapter 3. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who walks in an unruly manner and not according to the tradition which they received from us. Paul had given them many instructions in his first letter. And if you want to see those, just look in chapter 5. Tons of instructions there. But they don't all start the way this one does. Look towards the beginning of verse 6. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers. That's a pretty sobering preface to an instruction. Because what it does is it tells us that Christ's reputation is what is at stake here. This is not a trivial matter. We see what it is, and brothers are walking in an unruly manner. Drop down to verse 11, you see the details of what that is. We hear that some among you are walking in an unruly manner. What are they doing? They're doing no work at all. Instead, they're acting like busybodies. So the problem is they're not working. Notice the two things that Paul addresses here. He addresses the fact that they're shirking their work responsibility. First, you're not doing the work that you need to be doing. And secondly, you're involving yourself in superfluous things, things that don't matter. It wasn't enough that they weren't working, but they were spending themselves on the things that are useless, needless, irrelevant, the non-essentials. Matt shared this with us last week when we were listening to his teaching on First Thess. He shared that to be unruly is to intentionally choose to live outside of God's clear instructions. The unruly one is the one who knows the instruction and they intentionally choose to live beyond that instruction, outside of the reach of that instruction, contrary to the course and the aim of that instruction. Notice in verse six also that there's a tradition involved here. An unruly man are not according to the tradition which they receive from us. The tradition again is what Paul told them and what Paul taught them. Again, Divine revelation to Paul, articulated teaching from Paul to the church in Thessalonica. And Paul and his companions were an example to them in this. And we see that in verse 7. You yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we did not act in an unruly manner among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to you. The manner of living that Paul and Silas and Timothy put in front of the Thessalonians was exemplary. What did they do? They paid for their own food. They worked for their food. They worked hard, labor and hardship. They worked to provide for their own needs. It's important for us to understand the relationship between 
provision and work. Back in the garden before the fall in Genesis 3, if you think about Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, particularly Genesis 2, you see that there's work and you see that there's provision and they coexist together, but neither one is dependent upon the other. Adam was to participate in the task of work. God said, I want you to cultivate the garden. But at that same time, he had all the provision that he needed, but they were independent of one another. After the fall, work and provision became inextricably linked and related to one another. Genesis chapter 3, God is speaking with direct address to Adam, and he says, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you will eat of it. Verse 19, By the sweat of your face you will eat bread until you return to the ground. This is a lifelong endeavor. We know this today. There is a lifelong relationship between work and provision after the fall. But we need to see that work is God's gracious means of that provision for us in this fallen world. So to expect provision without participating in God's design to obtain that provision is to reject God's design for that provision in the first place. And that is a mar. That is a stain against the gospels. If our persecutors are going to think poorly about us because of anything, it needs to be because of the gospel message itself, not because we reject God's design for how we should live our lives. So that's the first consequence to their unruly living. But there's another consequence here, and we see it in verse 13. Paul says, as for you, brothers, do not lose heart in doing good. This is not a new idea. This is not an independent idea that he's starting with here. He's not moving on to another subject. This is closely related to the issue of unruly living because Paul is still on the same subject in verse 14. There were believers in Thessalonica who truly were needy, but the faithful, because they were weary of providing for the unruly, they were not assisting those who truly had needs. And that's another mar, another stain on our Savior and his reputation and his name. So that's why we see the corrective that we do see in verse 14. And if anyone does not obey our word in this letter, take special note of that person, not to associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Verse 15 makes it clear that this man is to be treated as a brother. This is a brother who has a sin problem. So help your brother with his sin. Don't associate with him so that he feels the shame associated with his choice. The church is to disassociate with him so he'll feel the shame and that will compel him away from his sin and enhance the reputation of Christ. So we have to ask ourselves as a point of application, are there areas of our life that are clearly contrary to God's design for Christians? Do I have any of those areas in my life? And if there are, have I thought about how that tarnishes the reputation of Christ, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ? You need to think about that carefully because Christ's reputation is at stake. So that's the letter. You have a, a very young church. It's a very persecuted church that is bearing up well under that persecution. But Paul's second letter to them has three main points of focus. They need to think rightly about their persecution. Paul is telling them your perseverance in that persecution is what proves that you belong to God. It proves your identity in Christ. That's the main thing they need to remember. But secondly, he teaches them about the false teaching and that a good working knowledge of the truth is essential in the life of every Christian. And thirdly, he's addressing their unruliness and he's saying eliminate it because Christ's reputation is at stake. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this letter. I thank you for the Apostle Paul and his faithful service to them, the example that he was to them, the example he is to us. I thank you for this truth. Lord God, that you are architecting the circumstances of our life so that when we persevere through those circumstances, it is proof to us that you are finishing the work that you began in us and that we belong to you. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us the complete content of your word. Lord, I pray that you would lay it upon our hearts and you would grant us your grace towards the end of reading your word well, knowing your word well, so that we can respond well to all of the false information that is around us. And by doing so, Lord, we can be a testimony as to what is right and what is good.
And Lord, would you help us to see the areas of our lives that are out of line with your design for us so that we can enhance the reputation of your son. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.